Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Can you understand my accent? Is it? <laughs> oh, that's true. Once a more um, thank you to uh, Bishop Susan, um, all of your bishops, uh, the National Church Council, uh, for inviting me to be with you at this um, um, convention. Um, it, it's, I had so much fun in, Ed, in Edmonton four years ago that they, you all invited me back and I said yes, so this is great. And thanks also to where is the Saskatchewan Synod for adopting me. I, I got to be in the picture, so that's great. <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> oh, I was a little leery when I saw that um, the gospel text was the Beatitudes because everyone has preached on the Beatitudes. Even if you're not a preacher, you've probably preached on the Beatitudes. <laughs> And I remember hearing a story about a pastor who had preached on the Beatitudes, and a woman came through the line to shake hands, and she said, great, more platitudes on the Beatitudes. <laughs> so I'm going to try not to fall into that uh, sort of thing. Um, but they really, are, they really are strange teachings from Jesus. And they are really strange teachings that, that a lot of times we just don't want to hear or we have ideas about what Jesus is trying to say, and I think it is not what our Lord is trying to say. I would say, first of all, that the Beatitudes are, are not welcome or accepted in a lot of places. I mean, we say blessed are the meek, but in our world, the meek don't get the land. They get pushed off into the floodplain or into the really horrible parts of the town. Blessed are those who mourn, but in our world, mourning may be tolerated for a while, but then we say, can't you just get over it? Blessed are the pure in heart, but in our world, such people are dismissed as hopelessly naive. Blessed are the peacemakers, but in our world, or at least my part of our world, those who pursue peace risk having their patriotism questioned. So these are uncomfortable words. You know, the weak, the ones who are the humiliated, the walked out on, have not been given their share of the earth, have been denied access to the world's resources, cannot enjoy the creation that God created for all people. How are they blessed? Those who mourn, they find no cause for joy. The poor in spirit are not those who trust and be God because they have no hope, rather, they have no hope, full stop. And those who hunger for thirst for righteousness, they thirst for justice that has been denied. These are hard sayings of Jesus that can sometimes be daunting, um, but unfortunately, and especially amongst Lutherans who are the least likely to accept grace, even though we talk about it all the time, um, we turn these into conditions that somehow we must fill in order for God to bless us. I have a, a, a colleague, Marcus Kuhns, uh, back in the ELCA, and he calls this subjunctivitis. So I don't, you ever had conjunctivitis? Do you call that pink eye, you call that up here? Yeah, okay. We're two people but separated by a common language. I, I wasn't really sure if that's true. <laughs> Usually it's the, us in the English, but, um, but he says subjunctivitis is when you, you take these verb tenses and you turn them into the subjunctive voice. It's, it's not, the whole thing there, it's in the indicative mood. God, Jesus says you will. You will be satisfied. You will inherit the earth. You will be called children of God. You will see God. It's not, oh gosh, you know, if I just work hard enough and try hard enough, it's not I could, I, if I could, I would, I should, I ought, then maybe God will do something for me. This is the subjunctivitis that clouds our eyes. I also call it kind of a transactional religion. So if I do something, then God's going to do something for me, which, you know, that's, that's not possible. But how many of us, you don't have to raise your hands, so you could just do it really secretly the Lutheran way. Raise your hand. How many of us somehow still don't trust that grace is free and grace is for all of us, that it is in fact too good to be true? So the Beatitudes become a burden, a burden. Or they, they can be turned into a how-to manual for discipleship. If we were just somehow poor and in spirit and meek and uh, all of those other things. That's what we should strive to be in order to be good and effective disciples. But I don't think that is what our Lord is telling us in any of these. That it's not subjunctivitis, that God is not a transactional God, that this is not a how-to manual on how to be the perfect disciple, and that these words are, in fact, 
unwelcome and, un and unacceptable in a culture, and I would speak for my own south of the border, that really promotes the autonomy of the individual to the point of, uh, of idolatry. We all believe we can pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, even people who have no idea what bootstraps are. Probably, this is, I, I'm digressing, probably it's not a liberal stand because Birkenstocks don't have bootstraps, so they probably wouldn't, <laughs> they probably wouldn't try it, so. What they are, what these words from Jesus are, are promises. It's not about our work. It's not about sage words from a great teacher. It's not about moral precepts. It, precepts. it doesn't depend on us. Remember Martin's Luther? M Martin's Rooster, pardon me? I got it mixed up, Martin, sorry. Mar Martin's Rooster? <laughs> the sun didn't come up because of his work. The sun came up because that's a promise, and the sun has risen because that's the promise God has made to all of us. And the promise is that you are blessed. We are blessed. We will receive what God promises. Not that we could be blessed if we earn or even deserve what God may give, but we are blessed. And that, that changes the way I hope that we take a look at and hear the gospel or read the gospel or experience the gospel. And Luther was pretty clear about this. Um, Luther said that the gospel is not a book of laws and commandments which requires deeds of us, but a book of divine promises in which God promises, offers, and gives us all our possessions and benefits in Christ. That's how Lutherans read scripture. And if you, if you want to impress your friends at home, that's the Lutheran hermeneutic. I'm kind of proud of that word, so. I... <laughs> wow. Interestingly enough, in Matthew, this is Jesus' inaugural address. This is the first public speech that he gives. In Luke, he's in the synagogue. But here, this is his inaugural ex uh, address. And I think it's, it's, it's telling that, that Jesus is laying before us the absolute promise that all of the things that the world despises, that the world sees as nothing, that the world can discount, in fact, are the places where God will most richly give blessings. And it doesn't depend on the person who's doing the, it's not what we do, that this is, this is the promise. And this will be, as we see, uh, Luther called it a, a portrait of, of Jesus as we move through the gospel. Now, I'm going to tell you about a funny thing that happened after uh, the inauguration down in the States of the latest um, resident in the White House. Um, so it was in February, and uh, an enraged parishioner called our bishop in New Jersey uh, and was complaining about her pastor. She said, I cannot believe, I cannot believe that the pastor deliberately chose a passage from Scripture to criticize the administration. And the bishop's thinking, well, what's going on in my parishes? I think you think that sometimes what's going on in your parishes with all these folks. Maybe that's just an American thing. You probably all read the lectionary. Okay, that's a good thing. <laughs> well, well, finally, she said, well, what, what was the passage? It was the Beatitudes, which is the fourth Sunday of Epiphany, year C, every three years. I think that maybe that woman was hearing Jesus' words with fresh ears that this is how the world works. This is the real world and not all these sham worlds that we put out. And interestingly enough, in Jesus' final address, his final public speech, Jesus becomes all of those things. He becomes the, the meek, those who mourn, the poor in spirit, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness or just hunger and thirst. Remember in Matthew 25, it's the judgment of the nations and the sheep and the goats become before him and Jesus said, blessed are you. He said, for I was hungry, I was thirsty, I was a stranger, I was naked, I was sick, I was in prison. Jesus becomes all of those blessings, those, those, those despised ones in the beatitude for us. But here's the wonderful promise that is realized because of the, of the work of God in Jesus Christ. It's not an, a goal or an ideal that awaits our action fulfillment. It is what God promises in Christ and promises to bring us to its service. We are not mere bystanders or spectators 
but actually have the joy and privilege in participating in the reconciling work God is working in the whole creation. When those sheep fed and gave drink and visited and welcomed those who were in prison or sick or were thirsty or naked or hungry, they were doing it as part of the reconciling work of Christ and as Jesus let them know, you were doing it to me. We're trying to make this clear, a couple of things. First of all, the Holy Family didn't have any papers when they had to flee to Egypt for their lives. Uh, but also, it's very clear in Scripture that when you welcome the stranger, you welcome me. And now we are called into this reconciling work. We are blessed to be a blessing. Your theme, called to journey together the ministry of reconciliation, speaks about this very thing. We're blessed not by what we do, but what God has done for us and now sets us free, has blessed us, and calls us to serve those, to restore creation, to be reconciled with the first peoples of this land, to understand that multi-religious neighbors are actually children of God as much as we are, and that blessing them is a way that we bless God. This is a marvelous and, I would say, liberating promise. I used to think that the, the, uh, the Beatitudes were, were just really tough, if you think about it. And I know in the first parish I served, um, their people, their exterior lives were so perfect that no one knew the interior pain that was going on in every family's life. Because let me tell you, it happens in every family. I say, families, God's punishment for original sin. <laughs> These people, they would vacuum their lawns. They had leaf vacuums back then. They didn't blow, they vacuumed. I don't know why, but it was, that's how perfect they had to be. And God says, no, you don't have to keep up that pretense. You don't have to take that energy-destroying approach of constantly trying to make sure that you're fine and you're better than everyone else and everything's okay. I know it's not, God said. I usually preach against, and I'm going to do this now, what I call Billy Joel theology. He was a singer in the States in the 80s. Okay, well, we don't always know your singers, so I don't want to assume that you know. I mean, I know our, our, our culture is just like over, you know, like a blob, but okay, sorry. Anyways, Billy Joel had the song, and in it, the chorus was, I like you just the way you are. God does not like us just the way we are. That's why God sent Jesus. God likes us the way God will make us to be. In these words, we hear that we are blessed now. And in Jesus' final address, public speech, he turned himself into the one needing our help and our aid that we might be blessed to be a blessing. And this is the work of the ELCIC. You're such a model for me and for many in my church, particularly in the lead that you're taking in care of creation in trying to restore a right relationship with indigenous people here and also welcoming the stranger I said this three years ago when Bishop Susan was at our assembly, you know, we're building walls and pieces and putting people in cages. Your prime minister was at the airport to welcome the first Syrian refugees. Don't ever give up and don't ever doubt first that you are blessed now, not because of what we've done, but what God has done for us and that God has enlisted us to be a blessing to the rest of the world. Amen.